Howdy neighbors, how is your garden growing? In my garden today, we're gonna to be talking about the fruits, flowers, and veggies that you should be adding in the month of March so that you can create the garden of your dreams in the sunshine state. And as always, I'm gonna be using my handy dandy Wild Floridian planner to help us with this discussion. Let's first talk vegetables. Whether you live in North Florida, Central Florida, or South Florida, everyone should be considering doing hot weather crops. That may seem a little weird because we're technically still in winter and we're thinking about crops that are gonna make their way through the heat and the humidity and intense sun of summer. But no matter where you live, you should be considering starting things like roselle, okra, sweet potatoes, and seminal pumpkins. All of these are what we would call hot weather crops. And the reason that they are kind of the difference between warm and hot is because they originate out of the tropics. So whether you're past your last frost date or even have a frost date, <laughs> by starting your hot weather crops now, you're gonna have something to put in your garden in the summer months. Now, some of you might be saying, um, I've never heard of some of these crops. What are you talking about? Wondering what you could do in place of like a cranberry substitute, use something like a roselle. It's in the hibiscus family and it puts out these awesome little calyxes that look really crazy, but they're so, so pretty. You boil them down and you can make your own cranberry sauce alternative. It tastes really good. Even my dad, who's super, super picky, like loves it. Another staple of the South is okra. It's another plant that comes out of the hibiscus family. And I would say this is kind of one of those love hate crops of the South. Many people really just can't get past its like texture. It has like a mucinogenic factor. And if you don't know what that means, it's kind of like the sliminess that you see in aloe. You can find that on a lot of different plants. And actually it's that kind of characteristic in the plant that allows it to like deal with the, the heat and the humidity and all the craziness that we get in the summer, which kind of feels weird right now because like, look at me, I'm wearing a sweatshirt because it's actually cold today. <laughs> but I actually enjoy fresh okra and eating it totally raw. I like getting them when they're like baby, baby ones and just snapping them off in the heat of summer. Other ones that I would consider adding, I've done loofah before and you can both eat these and use them as sponges in the shower. It really depends on how much work you wanna do, but if you're looking for those squash alternatives, loofahs in the squash family and you can use it like a fresh squash when you get them really, really small. So use them like a summer squash or a zucchini alternative. And so some of you might be feeling pretty good about this idea because if you've been struggling with summer squashes and zucchinis because of vine borers and all the pests that go after them, Lufa is way, 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 way more resilient to pest activity. It really honestly takes no effort. And if you're looking for something even more like classic squashes, I highly, highly, highly recommend Seminole Pumpkin. Seminole Pumpkins, if you like butternut squash, get a Seminole Pumpkin. They grow ridiculously well. Where I live in zone 10, I basically have planted them once and they keep coming back and coming back and coming back. They kind of die back in the winter time, but right now they are, I've got like 10, 12 foot vines and I didn't plant one seed. And if you want to learn way more about seminal pumpkins, I will link this video at the end, everything you need to know about seminal pumpkins. And of course, go ahead and get yourself some sweet potatoes started. Sweet potatoes are ridiculously easy. And especially for my central and South Floridians, this is one of those similar to seminal pumpkins. Once you get it one, bit in your yard, it can honestly keep going and going and going and then still keep going. <laughs> now, when it comes to warm weather crops, it's a little bit different depending on where you live. Both North and Central Florida, you guys can pretty much start all warm weather crops. I would be focused way more on transplants at this time of year. Hopefully you already got your seed started, but if you didn't, go ahead, find your local nurseries, or if you need to, run to one of the big box stores and snag some warm weather crops from there. This can be anything from beans, corn, tomatillos, eggplants, cucumbers, peppers, and tomatoes. A lot of varieties. Now, when it comes to some of these plants like your tomatoes, you do wanna focus on the varieties that have smaller tomatoes on them. I wouldn't be starting anything like beef steaks at this point. Maybe you can get away with that in North Florida. My zone nines, my zone tens, like you should not be touching a large tomato with a 10 foot pole right now. There is way too much warmth there is way too much insect activity. They will, are very unlikely to make it all the way to ripe. I would stick to more things that are like in that four ounce, two ounce, one ounce range. You know, you wanna look at things like your cherry tomatoes, grape tomatoes, your pear tomatoes, currant tomatoes. That would be something like your Everglades tomatoes. Stuff like that is going to be able to have time to mature and get to ripeness 
before you get the push of the pest activity because pest activity is going to increase dramatically in the month of March. The big thing is, is we now have a lot more days over 60 degrees. So all the bugs that went dormant through the winter are starting to hatch. And when they are babies, they are hungry and they are looking for things to eat. And that might be your tomatoes or your tomato leaves or your broccoli leaves. Anything is fair game at this point for them. So just be ready, they're coming. When it comes to things like peppers and eggplants, depending on the variety, oftentimes the ones that we tend to stick to, like ping tongue, or you wanna do something like a cubanelle pepper, they have natural deterrents like capsaicin. So you'll be more okay there. I definitely, if you're thinking about a pepper right now, do cubanelle peppers. They will go the distance through not only the end of the winter time, but springtime, and they will even head into many places into the summertime. So my South Floridians, you might be feeling sad. You're like, it's March, I'm already done. How can that be? But there are a few warm weather crops that you could consider. Think of things like corn and beans. And for everyone, sweet corns are great. <laughs> Florida is actually one of the top producers for sweet corn in the nation. The other thing you should be considering is beans. There are tons and tons and tons of options when it comes to beans. The beans that I will be doing are more of gonna be used like a hot weather crop. That's gonna be Puerto Rican black beans, but there are a lot of other varieties. Please share what beans you like to use. And if you've been loving all the tips and suggestions I've been giving you, plus you wanna track your own harvest and keep note of what's going on in your garden, I highly recommend grabbing your own copy of the Wild Floridian Garden Planner. And you can pick that up at www.wildfloridian.net slash planner. Which brings me to my next tip, which whether you're you're gonna be starting new warm weather crops like tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers or you already have them in the ground one of the things you need to consider doing for March in order to have really successful harvests throughout spring is you need to start adding flowers one of the key differences between your cold weather crops and your warm weather crops is whether they need to be pollinated in order for you to get a harvest things like your cold weather crops like your beets, your carrots, your onions, those are all root crops. They're gonna grow whether you have bees in your yard, whether you have butterflies in your yard. But in order to get things like your peppers, your eggplants, your tomatoes, you're not gonna get a good harvest if you don't have those bees in the area to help pollinate the flowers. One other thing, it's technically a cold weather crop, but we're gonna like sneak it in here for everybody, is you still could get away with carrots, whether you're in North Florida or South Florida or Central Florida, if they're your little, especially my South Floridians, if they're the little quickie guys, you know, like your sweet and shorts, they're gonna have like a 60 day turnaround. You're still gonna be cool enough. Another one, if you're feeling like, eh, buying plants, I don't know what to do. And you want a really simple one to start that you can still get a good harvest on. And it's still really, really easy. You can still get green onions in the ground. Not your classic large bulbing onions, but yes, those green bunching onions, you can buy them from the store, use them in a the dish, and then go ahead and just replant them. It's warm enough now that transplanting out these little, little kitchen scraps still works. So go do it. Now, of course, beyond all of our classic vegetable crops, one of the things that you should consider adding to your garden is herb because nothing gives you a better return on investment when it comes to fresh herbs versus how much you'll pay at the store. Now we're kind of in a unique period of the year because we're technically winter, but we're kind of heading into the warmth that we would see in spring. So you've got a lot of options for herbs that you could plant this month. You can, of course, just like last month, still plant things like coriander, thyme, parsley, fennel, and chives. That's both garlic chives and onion chives. In addition, especially my central and my south Floridians, there are a bunch of other herbs that you should also consider adding, especially things like basil, sage, dill, tarragon, lemon balm, oregano, and lavender. You can either start these by seeds or go ahead and just grab yourself some transplants. Now let's talk fruits. These of course are the plants that you plant them once and then you're gonna get harvest year after year after year. You live in Central and South Florida and you've been thinking you wanna do a food forest. Some ideas for you. Of course, I'm going to recommend the banana. Bananas are of course people's favorite fruit in the United States, actually across the whole world. And what can be better than having your own fresh bananas. And while you consider bananas, I know y'all are gonna go out there looking and you're gonna see someone say, you can only get one bunch of bananas 
from one banana tree and you're gonna be devastated and it's so confusing. <laughs> but let me set your mind at ease. You will get many, many bunches of bananas from your banana plant. So check out the video so you can learn way more about bananas and consider adding them to your garden if you live in Central and South Florida. Another really great one, especially my Central and South Floridians who get really sad that they cannot grow a lot of cabbage here in Florida, let me recommend papaya to you. And papaya is great because it grows fast. It usually produces in the first year. You can eat the fruits fully ripe or you can use them as green papayas. And this is where if you've been wondering and worrying about your cabbage plants that get eaten by cabbage moss and you're so sad, really, really consider getting a papaya. You may have noticed in my garden planning that I put zero cabbage. I have planted cabbage before, but part of the reason is because we have papayas and we produce over 50 pounds of papaya a year. And oftentimes we actually harvest this green and we use it in place of green cabbage. They take up so little space, unlike a lot of other fruiting trees, which can go anywhere from 20, 30 to 70 feet tall. I'm looking at you, lychee. This is a super compact plant. So if you don't have a lot of space, papayas is a great, great option. And I totally recommend you look into it. And here we are going to March and we're heading away from February. And a lot of y'all just got to have a ton of fresh strawberries because Florida is great at making strawberries, but maybe you did not make a really good strawberry harvest and you're so sad because you don't have enough berries in your life. But now might be the time to add a mulberry and mulberries, so easy. Another one that you can have in a pretty compact space, especially if you do something like the everbearing mulberry, which is actually a shrub tree. So do not bemoan the fact that you didn't get enough strawberries. Just go ahead and get yourself a small everbearing mulberry. Which brings me to one of my tips about fruit for the month of March. Because we're coming to the period, not only where you could plant new fruiting trees, but also if you have fruiting trees in your yard, it's because we're moving past those potential freezes, now is a really great time to consider fertilizing your fruiting trees, especially your tropicals, because they're about to wake up and they're gonna be super hungry. So consider adding nutrition to that area so that you can get the most out of your harvest for this year. And I had an idea because I was thinking about how I was gonna put at the end, banana video, the papaya video, I have a mulberry video, I have seminal pumpkin video, my favorite varieties of warm weather crops. I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna make a playlist for you guys that I'm gonna put at the end. You can get a much deeper dive into these fruiting trees, plus some of the vegetables, plus some of the next topics we're gonna talk about, which is flowers. Now, when it comes to flowers and your garden, there are kind of two different things you may be considering right now. One is that you want to get some pollinators in your yard so you can help with your warm weather crop harvest and potentially some of your hot weather crop harvest down the road. Or two, you wanna add some color into your garden. Or three, you wanna help support wildlife even better. But regardless of which it is, let's talk about some of the flowers you should consider either adding or having in your garden for the month of March. So let's first talk about native wildflowers that are gonna help you with your harvest. And my top three picks for this time of year are going to be salt and pepper, tropical sage, and beach verbena. When it comes to the month of March, all three of these blooms, especially in my area, are already happening. They're not going to bloom, they are blooming. So if you have a lot of pollinators that are waking up or migrating into the area, this is an amazing, amazing thing set of plants. First up, salt and pepper, Minothera nivea. This plant can bloom potentially all year depending on where you live in the state. The salt and pepper is in my top 10 list for easy, native plants to begin with. The next one that I would recommend is tropical sage. Tropical sage is hands down an amazing plant. Pollinators of all sizes like it. It definitely brings the tropical aspect to your garden. It of course comes in three colors, which is the coral red, the flamingo pink, and of course just a classic white. And what's great about tropical sage is it can take quite a bit of shade. So if you've used a lot of your sunny space, for your vegetable plants, you can push this into that semi-shade area that's nearby that isn't as good for your vegetables and still bring in lots of pollinators to the area. My third choice, of course, is gonna be beach verbena. This one, again, I wouldn't add any of these directly in the bed with your crops, but this one also can go into a container. It's gonna look really cute. And honestly, you could probably do like a mix of tropical sage and beach verbena down low, but beach verbena is a great one for starter and it blooms throughout the winter time. And why this is really important that all three of these have been blooming through the winter time is that depending on your pollinators, 
pollinators needs throughout the winter time, this is gonna help support the pollinators when your vegetables are putting out flowers. It's one of the big mistakes a lot of people do in vegetable gardening is they only really think about the food from themselves. Even when it comes to the flowers, they only think about having flowers around when they need flowers. But if you wanna have a good supply of pollinators in your garden, you have to plan to feed them all year round, at least all the time when they're awake. And for areas like zone eight, nine, 10, and 11, that's most of the year. So you do wanna have blooms that are going even when you don't need them because you got a bunch of, you know, cauliflower and broccoli. Now, for those of you who are just looking to add wildflowers to your garden for color, there are a lot of options that we can have right now. But because we're at the end of the winter time, there is something that happens at this time of year, which I find really interesting. And it's a lot of our late winter blooms tend to be in the either white or blue color. We've already talked about salt and pepper, but there's a couple others that are all in that blue color that really come in right now before a lot of your other wildflowers come in. And that's gonna be things like Stokes Aster, Woodland Phlox, and blue-eyed grass. But let me add a bonus tip for you guys because we're at March. I've talked to you guys about pest pressure increasing. I talked to you about the bugs are coming back. But if we wanna turn that negative into a positive, March is a great time to start a butterfly garden because all the butterflies are not back yet. It's a good time to establish host plants. So for all my people who want to save the monarch butterfly, consider getting your butterfly garden in now. You should consider adding things like swamp milkweed or butterfly weed or aquatic milkweed. Those are kind of the three most readily available milkweeds in the market. And if you wanna learn way more about butterfly gardening. I will put this video in our must know information for March. And I will put this video that has a lot to do with milkweed and monarchs so that you can get a crash course in getting your, not only your butterfly garden, but getting monarchs to that garden. Now, if you're looking to go a little bit beyond wildlife and wildflowers and you want to have big, bold color that's coming in the month of March, there are a lot of options. As we warm up, so many plants are putting out big, super blooms. And whether you live in North Florida or Central Florida, consider adding azaleas. There are native types of azaleas and then there are Florida friendly types of azaleas. They are both gorgeous. Most of what you guys see when you do see azaleas are the non-native type. They're from Southeast Asia. They're gorgeous. There's no issue with them. The only watch out with them is a lot of people think that that version is native but it's not. There's two major types that you will find from the native side. That's going to be of course the pinkster and flame azalea. Both are gorgeous and both would be great additions to your landscape. One thing that makes them so great is that these plants actually don't wanna be in full sun. So if you have those shadier locations that you're always thinking, what do I do with them? Go ahead and think about adding, whether it's a native azalea or a Florida friendly azalea to those sections so you can get some big, bold, beautiful color at this time of year. And if you're excited about native plants that bring big, bold colors, a couple others for North and Central Florida would be the Eastern Redbud and the sweet acacia. Now for South Florida, also parts of Central Florida, we've got a bunch of stuff going into bloom at this time of year. Of course, similar to last month, we we continue to have things like bougainvillea, we have ixora, I'm seeing a lot of my hibiscuses wake up. All of these have big bold flowers and are Florida friendly. Other things that are coming into bloom, especially my South Floridians, is a frangipani, AKA plumeria. This is an amazing plant that comes out of the South Pacific. If you're looking for something to add to those areas that have sandyish soil and get a lot of sun, consider getting a frangipani, AKA plumeria. We've also talked about other bold flowering trees like the Hong Kong orchid, but there is another set of trees that are coming into bloom and those are the tababuyas. Some of them actually would have bloomed as early as February, which is like the pink tababuya, AKA the pink trumpet flower. If you have been seeing those trees that look like they're just covered in cotton candy, that is the pink tababuya. They put on these huge, gorgeous, bold super blooms. So if you're looking for that like fairy cottage garden or just wanna add a lot of color to your garden with a tree, pink tababuya. In the same family of trees is of course the golden trumpet tree or the yellow tababuya. This one blooms usually after the pink one and can sometimes put out two sets of blooms with the second bloom not being quite as strong. Depends a little bit on the weather, but if you've been seeing kind of these big, bold yellow trees, Right now, that would be your yellow trumpet trees. I'm going down the list. We have so many tips in here. So a couple more tips that you really should consider as you're in the month of March. Another thing you need to pay attention to, of course, is water needs. 
March is still in our drought time period. And while we're gonna get rain, we usually get about two and a half inches of rain. It's gonna be super sporadic. We may have a couple days where it rains a lot and then nothing for a week or two. Now we talked about the heat bringing a lot of wildlife back, but we haven't really mentioned the fact that this is the time of year that weeds come back super, super, super strong. If you have not gotten them into control, they are about to take over on you. So move quickly take advantage before they really, really get a good strong foothold, start flowering and putting seeds everywhere. If you need help identifying some of the common weeds that you see in your garden, I have this video here. I will also add that to the playlist so that you can start identifying weeds and making some decisions on how, which ones maybe you want to tackle first, but you need to, like, it's going to get bad. <laughs> Trust me, been here, done that. And another thing beyond weeds that's about to take off is are migratory birds. All those birds that have been here throughout the winter time are about to start heading back north, whether they're coming from South America, the Caribbean, or they've been overwintering here in Florida, they're going to head north. And what most people don't realize is that they travel at nighttime. So if you wanna help our migratory bird species, besides planting native plants and helping support bugs, one of the biggest things that you can do right now that's super simple is just turn off your lights at night. A lot of our migratory birds get taken off track by our nighttime lights. And so just simply turn off your lights or set them on a timer to turn off after 10 o'clock and you're gonna help wildlife out more than you know. Whew, okay, so there's a lot to do and a lot to think about. So if you wanna learn about more, everything from seminal pumpkins, bananas, mulberries, papaya, is my top native plants to start with 30 plus weeds identified how to start a butterfly garden host plants to start with all those things i'm going to put them in this playlist right here if you just want a crash course on how all this florida gardening works so you can wrap your head around it i will put this video beginner's guide to florida gardening okay i'll see you soon bye